Net Zero 2030 in focus. Too far. Too fast. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society and I wanted to talk with you today about a conference that I watched this week called Net Zero 2030 in Focus and I think there are quite a few issues that Canadians should be aware of in terms of climate policy that's coming down the pipe and probably not very many of you watched the conference. So I'm going to review some of the things in the conference and also offer some rebuttals to some of the um, what I felt were rather unicorn ideas presented in the conference. So with no further ado, let's continue with uh, Too Far, Too Fast, Net Zero 2030 in focus. Now it's a fairly um, full program here, so you might want to get a coffee in the middle of it and come back to it. So this is the conference that I'm addressing today and it was hosted by the Canadian Climate Institute and the Net Zero Advisory Body um, and at the 2030 in focus the um, uh, Climate Institute uh, presented a number of their reports in the uh, video in between sessions and they said that what we heard net zero is not just a government policy national and global economic and policy trends are driving toward net zero and building momentum so let's see if that's true now one comment I can make there seems to be a belief among climate activists at this event that the war in Ukraine should accelerate the implementation of wind and solar in most of the world there's a presently a mad scramble for conventional energy oil natural gas and coal and prices are being driven sky high because climate activists and banking gurus like Mark Carney have driven investment out of fossil fuels thus creating a shortage and thus energy price spikes the Ukraine conflict simply exacerbated this trend so Mark Carney is wrong about stranded assets and you can see here this is a very influential item where he really literally threatened companies with bankruptcy if they didn't play along on the climate bandwagon and you can see here that the um, projections for oil use in the world and energy use in the world is up 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 in the non-OECD countries and uh, uh, up a little bit in the OECD countries that would be the developed West so the greatest rise in energy use is not going to come from the West it's going to come from developing nations and they really don't care about climate change and there are many inconvenient facts for climate activists I invite you to have a look at this summary that Robert Lyman did of the uh, Natural Resources Canada Energy Factbook and for instance um, activists like to claim that energy is not a major contributor to Canada's economy especially outside Alberta but in fact the energy sector GDP in Alberta in 2020 was the highest in Canada 59.6 billion but it was also significant in other provinces notably Ontario 15.6 billion Quebec 12 billion, British Columbia 11.8 billion, and Saskatchewan 10.5 billion. So that's not all that's in that fact book, but you should have a look at that and see. It's a reality check. And of course, if you're going to create a green utopia, um, you're going to need a lot of oil, natural gas, and coal. Because um, here, as I show in this funny little video, using chocolate instead of oil you can see that all these big facilities whether they be big solar farms or big wind turbines they're all drenched in oil natural gas and coal and how are things made from what well to get wind power you need oil so if we're going to build more wind and solar then we're going to be using more oil and here's the ultimate reality check here those who expect to eliminate fossil fuels, which is all this part here, expect this little sector here to replace all of these. So this is the world consumption. 
So that's just not realistic. Now, let's look at impartiality of this uh, conference. The Canadian Climate Institute was formerly known as the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, and they claim to be a think tank that is uh, the strength of their work is rooted in their independence. <laughs> but in fact, they began as a government funded body. The Canadian Climate Institute, or the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, is made possible through the financial support of Environment and Climate Change Canada. So uh, today they are a registered charity. They only began that, I think, in 2019. Uh, we don't really have their financials listed, but one thing that we do know is that the original Canadian Institute for Climate Choices was funded by the federal government for something on the order of $21 million. So that makes them hardly an independent organization. And likewise, the uh, Net Zero Advisory Board, uh, many of these people are fairly well-known activists in the climate community. And uh, later on in the uh, Net Zero 2030 in focus, uh, Minister Gilbo noted that he had requested that this woman join and chair the organization, uh, which hardly seems to suggest that it's independent either. Uh, so one of the things that was continuous throughout the conference was the conflating of extreme weather and climate. So they claimed that the cost of climate change series from the Canadian Climate Institute documents how Canada is suffering from increasingly devastating wildfires, floods and extreme weather. The Institute's research shows that adaptation can dramatically cut those costs, securing a more affordable and prosperous future. Well, adaptation is uh, certainly the way to go, and uh, that's one of the things that we recommend, but there's no increasing uh, propensity for wildfires or extreme weather events. What's happened is that people have built very expensive infrastructure on floodplains, for instance, downtown Calgary's flood. Now, there were worse floods before 1933, there were eight of the worst floods in Calgary's history before 1933. But it was almost harmless because most of the structures there were small wood frame houses. Now you have multi-billion dollar towers on a floodplain and uh, the worst floods in Calgary's history actually were in the late 1800s. The same is true of uh, the Sumas River area in BC. That used to actually be a lake. <laughs> um, and uh, the dikes have not been kept up. But the worst uh, floods in that time were, um, I think, 1894. And if you look down the coast to Sacramento in 1861 and 2, they had an atmospheric river that brought 40 days of rain. So these are not new things that are being caused by human activities or carbon dioxide emissions. These are real natural events and we should build for the worst of them and not assume that there won't be another one for a hundred years. This is an inappropriate use of that um, hundred year flood, 500 year flood. These are inappropriate uh, uses of that. That's, that's intended to um, uh, associate the the ratio of that type of flooding. It's not intended to predict the time frame of when another flood would happen. So there's no increase in wildfires. There's uh, no increase in um, heat events. There's uh, no increase in all of the catastrophic things that these people say. And that's what the data shows. But they don't look at data. They, they look at newspaper headlines. And sometimes they create them. And of course, Judith Curry says it perfectly here. Thinking that catastrophes like major hurricane landfalls, massive forest fires, will be cured by eliminating fossil fuel emissions is laughable. Well, it's really not funny 
thinking that eliminating fossil fuel emissions will solve the problem of extreme weather events is very sad, sort of on the level of doing rain dances. Everything that goes wrong, they blame on fossil fuel driven climate change. Imagine how surprised they would be if we were ever to, able to successfully eliminate fossil fuel emissions and then we still had bad weather. So we have a couple of things on our website. We have an open letter here to EcoJustice Executive Director Devin Page explaining that extreme weather is uh, not related to human causation of climate change. We have a short little uh, video here and we have a longer one here which uh, both review peer-reviewed literature and debunk the crazy headlines that we keep hearing. And then of course there's also Roger PLK Jr.'s book, The Rightful Place of Science, Disasters and Climate Change. He's worked with the insurance agencies for 25 years and um, He's got all the data there that you need. Um, now, oddly, at this event, this activist who just appeared in a BBC Panorama documentary trashing B uh, BC wood pellet industry, especially Drax, which is a baseload energy provider in the UK, well, now he's on stage in Canada and spreading misinformation. He claimed that wind is nine times cheaper than conventional energy. But in fact, wind drives up power prices and destabilizes the grid. This is from a um, Fin Advice document out of Switzerland, which shows that in Germany the grid instability uh, rose dramatically from the implementation of wind. And uh, grid interventions mean that the operators of the electrical system have to intervene and either load shift, load shed, shut down, constrain uh, energy use here or there so that the grid won't collapse and go to blackout. And you can see these retail electrical prices in countries. All these countries have lots of wind power and their prices are just skyrocketing. So um, wind and solar are not free. And of course much of the uh, 2030 in focus was based on magical thinking. So they claimed that connecting the dots, uh, that the public were connecting the dots on climate and extreme weather. Well, I just showed you that's wrong. They claimed the gas price crisis, Ukraine cost of living, and that the core of these problems is fossil fuels, and that decarbonizing is the most important thing to do. And that's wrong. The core is the lack of investment in fossil fuels, which means an energy shortage, and that leads to price shock. And this gentleman said in the UK, where I'm from, gas prices are 10 times what they were a year ago, which is true. So he says it's a very good idea to invest in a strategy to have our gas, energy security for UK invest, decarbonize because that delivers that that delivers you wrong <laughs> wind and solar actually need nimble backup natural gas is usually the choice and he thinks that you don't need to care about the climate you save the economy money so you don't even need to care about net zero but wrong there are no savings huge costs and reliability challenges and you still need natural gas and he said, people generally understand some of this now. Run as fast as you can. The stars have magically aligned. Wrong. There's no magic. There's no stars. They're just green climate policies driving the economy into the ditch. And I recommend that people read Robert Lyman's report that's on our blog, Magical Thinking, Why Net Zero is Neither Possible Nor Desirable funny they didn't have Robert Lyman at this event. Um, then at the conference they had a group of finance folks and uh, RBC apparently is gone for Alberta Renewable PPAs. These are power purchase agreements to green their banking. But in fact it costs Albertans a fortune for no power grid benefit. 
And while I was putting this PowerPoint together, I just went on the Alberta Electric System Operator to check what was going on. So this was October the 20th at uh, 6, almost 7 p.m. at night. What do we have here? We have no solar, of course, because now we're into fall. We have only 236 megawatts of uh, total net generated wind out of uh, almost 10 times that possible. This is the maximum capacity here in the, in the MC column. And this is the actual generation. So what do we have? We have Alberta running on gas and coal. And we have Alberta running on imported hydro from BC, imported coal-fired power from Montana, and in co imported coal-fired power from Saskatchewan. So um, RBC has signed these long-term power purchase agreements. Um, these are very expensive for Alberta, even though they claim that it will bring an initial investment here. That's probably true, but over the long term, Albertans will pay a fortune. And we have an independent voice on this matter. The finance people are all part of the network for greening the financial system. This is a recent video that Roger PLK Jr. did. And uh, he noted that the scenarios used in climate stress testing by central banks around the world are wildly implausible and of questionable practical utility. So, um, and part of the problem is that they keep referring to material that relates to what's called RCP 8.5 and 6. RCP 8.5 has commonly been uh, referred to as the business as usual scenario and this refers to RCP uh, refers to the representative concentration pathway meaning the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and its warming impact but these are both implausible so if you take these away we don't have a climate emergency uh, and the many mainstream climate scientists agree that these are implausible scenarios. And also one of the finance people said investment advisors are not climate conversant, but they would be studying it. <laughs> well, good luck with that, because here's kind of a um, schematic, a visualization of climate as a chaotic, a nonlinear dynamic system. And you can see here in atmospheric composition and winds, we have a little dot of contribution there. This is probably far, far bigger than it is <laughs> in real life, but you have to be able to see it. And in the background, you can see the sun is the main driver affecting all of these different things and earth to scale, not to scale, but it gives you an idea that uh, climate is affected by more than just humans. And one person really liked the IPCC SR 1.5 report that was from 2018. But to be fair, that focused on the implausible RCP 8.5 scenario. So here's our rebuttal to that our, um, IPC SR 1.5 report. And in the most recent IPCC AR6 Working Group 1 report, that means the physical scientists, the actual scientists, they see no crisis. So, and this again is from a Roger PLK article where he felt that it's too bad that this was not publicly stated. The extreme scenario that IPC saw as most likely in 2013 is now judged a low likelihood. So that's great news. The climate emergency is over. And we do have time. Now, one of the most difficult things in the Net, 30, uh, Net Zero 2030 in focus conference for me was the fantasy versus reality. So, this is part of an interview between the Prime Minister and uh, this fellow from England. They talked for about uh, over half an hour, and the Prime Minister said, Right now, the coming couple of years we're going to need to continue with the mechanisms we have but to move off fossil fuels is going to happen much faster because of Russia. So you can see over here this is Canada's total energy supply by source. 
This is from the International Energy Agency. And you can see here that uh, coal provides a small but important sector here. Natural gas is huge and has been increasing. Um, nuclear is pretty solid, very important because it's stable base load. Then we have hydro, which is also important. And then you can't see it, wind and solar. So that's it. There's a tiny little line that you can hardly see here, which represents wind and solar. Then we have biofuels and waste. And of course, oil. So this is the total energy supply. This is not just the power grid. But you can see that this is not going to happen overnight. Uh, that's impossible. And we're not going to move off it fast because, as I pointed out, wind and solar are all made from oil, gas, and coal. And you'd wonder why we would want to move off oil and gas when we're one of the world's largest oil producers. These are our competitor nations. Um, <laughs> so every one of these nations wins when our product is blocked from the market. Likewise, we're also a leading producer of natural gas. And again, every one of these competitor nations wins when we can't get our product to market. So I would say that the policies presented are impotent. And uh, they went on to interview Minister Gilbo and Minister Wilkinson. And I'll show you why I say that. First of all, people seem to be mesmerized by the 2 degree uh, Celsius target or the 1.5 degree target of the um, Paris Agreement. Uh, but in fact, if Canada stopped all of its emissions, there would be no difference in climate change in the world. And uh, just to be clear, China emits in one month about what Canada emits in one and a half years. So nothing we do would ever meet this uh, target, which is a questionable target to begin with. One of the things that Minister Wilkinson was very proud of was the hydrogen deal struck with Germany. So I've done a video about this, which is on our website. Um, first of all, Germany doesn't need hydrogen. They need natural gas because they're a chem chemical producer and they produce a lot of different materials from natural gas product stream uh, and hydrogen doesn't offer that. Secondly, um, hydrogen is a very uh, dangerous molecule to work with. It's the smallest molecule. It has unique properties in that it can actually embrittle metal so if it's in a very highly pressurized container, and whether it be a pipeline or whether it be a fuel cell, it has an intrinsic ability to embrittle that metal, make it crack, and then it can sneak out. Now, as it starts to sneak out, because it's the smallest and lightest gas, there's uh, some kind of inertia there that creates static electricity, and that can cause an explosion. So it's a very difficult molecule to handle. And not only that, like presently we do produce hydrogen in Canada. We produce quite a lot of it because we need it for agriculture. We need it to make fertilizer, but we make it from natural gas. And that process is pretty much down pat. It's also very well managed. There are strict safety protocols and lots of industrial monitoring equipment. So it's quite safe in that regard. Uh, but if we're going to consider, consider putting it in the public's hands, that's not going to be very safe. But let's go and look at some costs here. Now, interestingly enough, uh, this report was done by Robert Lyman. He looked at the federal government's own internal auditing departments, and they found that currently the estimated cost of generating hydrogen using wind and solar energy would be 17 times the cost of natural gas. So that would not be a competitive product. And this is from another energy analyst, uh, 
Michael Liebrecht, I think his name is. Anyway, he um, he assessed whether or not uh, making hydrogen from uh, green energy, wind and solar, do, how does it make commercial sense? Because what happens here is that there's an energy loss every step of the way. And that's not what you want with energy. You want to reap more benefits from the energy that you get. So he shows that you start with 100 watts of electricity. It drives an electrolyzer. This, create, this splits water into hydrogen and oxygen. You then uh, lose some of your power. So that's 70 watts. You liquefy it. That's another loss. You uh, then have to ship it. That's another loss. Uh, you have to gasify and store it there's another loss and then you have to um, distribute it and there's another energy loss so by the time you're done you really have very little of the energy left so he doesn't see it as a viable proposition now the other thing that uh, Minister Wilkinson was very proud of and excited about was the idea of building an east-west uh, power grid to electrify everything. So on the one hand, if we look at the electricity generation by source in Canada, and again this is from the IEA, International Energy Agency, you can see here that we are sitting pretty in terms of clean energy generation and hydro. We are one of the biggest hydro producers in the world. But hydro is not evenly distributed. It's uh, down in the Maritimes, it's in Quebec, and it's in British Columbia, but elsewhere not so much, a bit in, in uh, Manitoba. So these other uh, needs are very important, coal, um, natural gas, and uh, nuclear. Now wind is noted here, you can see it says this little white block down here, but that's very tiny. Um, and uh, solar PV is this kind of little, mm, you can barely see it, purple line here. Where's my cursor? There. <laughs> That's solar. So you can't expect that this down here is going to replace this in eight years. That's impossible. Uh, so, it, and you have to look that. Uh, all the big hydro is taken. You can see that Canada has mountainous regions here. There's, that's why there's a lot of hydro in BC. And some uh, uh, regions here which are suitable to hydro. But, and out here, but you know, all this in the middle, no, that's not suitable to hydro. And if you're planning on running transmission lines all across Canada, uh, and interconnecting the, provi the provinces, then you're actually asking for national blackouts, not to mention the cost would be astronomical. Now people keep saying, well, you know, pre previous governments never met any of our climate targets, uh, but in fact, emissions have been pretty flat for uh, 30 years. But what did happen is that we had a 37% increase in population. So that's why emissions targets were not met. And that's why they won't be met again. Because Canada is accepting 400,000 immigrants every year. And the goal in the Century Initiative is to add 63 million people to Canada. And Darshan Maharaja did the math for us here. Uh, and uh, he just did some quick off-the-cuff math. Adding another 63 million people to Canada would increase our CO2 emissions by 1.05 billion tons yearly. So whatever is being proposed in the net zero 2030 plan uh, will be completely wiped out just by immigration. So Minister Gilbo and Minister Wilkinson were interviewed separately and um, uh, this is why I say it's too far too fast. Uh, Minister Gilbo said that the clean electricity standard would be the most difficult. I concur, and I've showed you a bit of why. 
And he was very proud of the fact that we are deploying $109 billion in Canada, which is less money than the U.S., but per capita, it's three times what they're doing. Well, where would that money come from? And he also noted that normally it would take five to six years to pass these kinds of regulations and legislation. And the time frames we've imposed is three years, he said. Now, Minister Wilkinson said that he thought the most challenging issue would be the east-west power grid. And yes, I concur with that. He says, I think of it building the Canadian Pacific Railway. Well, <laughs> you know, that's, that's pretty funny because the railway was built in a fairly short time. But uh, what did you need? You needed steel rails, spikes, and uh, railway ties made from wood. So the elements going into the construction, and of course all the labor that went along with it, the elements going into the construction were relatively simple. Now, if you're trying to build an east-west power grid, you're going to be uh, needing to order all kinds of very complex electrical components. Um, uh, you'll need uh, transformers, very big transformers. You need all kinds of uh, inverters, uh, various substations where, where high voltage power will be stepped up or down um, according to the regional needs you need. All these things uh, take sometimes well over a decade just to order them because they're all pretty much special orders. Uh, and you need kilometers of, um, ten of transmission line, high voltage transmission line, all those big pylons. So this is not a simple project. It's not something you can do overnight. Um, all the routes have to be very carefully analyzed. And of course, in Canada, we have a seasonal issue, a very big one in terms of infrastructure projects. There are only a few months of the year when you can do this kind of major construction on infrastructure. Uh, so it's not something that can be done in eight years. Uh, and it can't be done easily. It cannot be done economically. and as I will note later on, we have some en engineers who've done sort of preliminary assessments. They say that it's, uh, it may be technically feasible, but it's not desirable and might end up in national blackouts. So that's not what we want. Um, and we still would not have enough power generation. We would have to build many more power plants. Even for the present EV policy, we would need to build um, eight more Site C dam equivalents. Eight more. And each one of those takes 20 to 30 years to build. Each one and costs billions of dollars. And from each one of those you need to string kilometers of high tension or high, trans uh, high voltage transmission lines. Um, and all that surveying just to find the route takes years. So, you know, these are really um, not well thought out plans. And the problem, the real problem, is that we might get part way into them and realize what kind of trouble we're in and then we will have spent a lot of money and uh, wasted a lot of time and resources and end up broke and in the dark. So, I, uh, I think that there needs to be a really big rethink on that. and. Here's the um, assessment that I was telling you about. Uh, this is something that we did in 2016 or 2015, and we submitted it as part of our proposal on the Paris Agreement. But the real problems, national blackouts, impossible parameters, and ridiculous costs. So we have this both in French and English. If you'd like to have a look at it, it's on our blog. But Here's something that Canadians should really wake up and smell the coffee here. This is a problem. Um, the Climate uh, Institute, the one that was originally funded by the federal government, and Clean Prosperity, which is kind of a fellow traveler in the world of climate change ideology, they think it would be a grand idea to uh, close the carbon pricing certainty gap by having contracts for differences. So this is a proposal that they think would 
accelerate up to 40 million tons worth of emissions by 2030. And just to give you a little bit of context here, here's a map of Ontario versus Beijing, the city in China. Ontario's entire emissions are about equal to those of the city of Beijing, China. So the whole province's emissions are equal to one city in China. In fact, the annual emissions from cigarette smoking in communist China is 36 million tons. So Ontario's GHG emissions in 2020 were uh, 149.6 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Well, so uh, 40 million tons worth of emissions reduction over an eight-year period doesn't seem to be very credible if these guys think they're actually going to hit net zero. But they want to use this contract for differences as a policy to guarantee investors money, whether or not the carbon tax remains, whether it rises, or whether it falls. And so here's their proposal, and they think it should be announced at COP27. The federal government should take urgent action to guarantee the scheduled increases in the carbon price through 2030 and to guarantee the future value of carbon credits. Reducing the policy risks faced by firms will accelerate investment in Canada's industrial decarbonization. Right, that's like, that would really, uh, that's almost like a guaranteed carbon price income, you know, rather than a guaranteed basic income. If you're a company, it's a guaranteed carbon price income so that you never have to worry that if there was an incoming government that canceled the carbon tax, then you're, uh, you would still be paid the same amount as originally contracted by this government, which wants carbon pricing to go up to $170 a ton by 2030. Um, so think about that. There's no other commodity in the world where there's a guaranteed price. Like we can look at natural gas, which has now spiked dramatically. Oil has spiked dramatically. Even coal has spiked dramatically. Wheat prices, another type of commodity, are fluctuating wildly. Nobody gets a guaranteed price for 20, 30 years. Uh, so uh, this is... Uh, a very scary thought that basically a mouthpiece arm institute of the government is self-proposing a policy that would guarantee investors and companies a price on carbon that you would have to underwrite as a taxpaying citizen. And uh, so let's go on and see because I got some comments from Robert Lyman on this too. So then they propose that the federal government should announce its plan to address carbon pricing certainty gap as soon as possible and detail it no later than the 2023 federal budget. This will show Canadian industry that the government is serious about guaranteeing the carbon price and start driving urgently needed investment right away. An ideal opportunity to announce the plan would be at the United Nations Climate Change Conference COP27 in November 2022. And that will help position us as a climate leader, as if we care. So uh, there was an article in CBC earlier this year, Liberal Climate Plan looks to guarantee a carbon price, no matter who is in power. And of course, an energy industry executive said, I think it's something that makes a lot of sense. Well, yeah, you would. Uh, so I asked Robert Lyman about this. Now, Robert is a former public servant of 27 years with the federal government. Uh, he was a diplomat for 10 years. And his comments, uh, I've, I've shortened them a bit, but they go something like this. I have never seen an example of hubris that exceeds this proposal, no doubt inspired by the companies and groups that now expect to benefit competitively from the proposed freezing of carbon tax rates in future at the rates already announced but not implemented by the Trudeau government. Where does one start to explain what is wrong with this idea? First, perhaps, with feasibility. In Canada, the legislation approved by the present Parliament, including that governing taxation and expenditures, cannot bind the actions of a future Parliament. 
In other words, policies and taxes imposed by the Trudeau government can be amended or rescinded by any future parliament. Second, there is the fact that the present Canadian carbon tax rate is one of the highest in the world. Only 46 national governments have implemented carbon tax, uh, carbon dioxide tax regimes. Most of them have rates of $30 per ton or less. And going on, he says, third, the Canadian system of taxation and expenditure includes hundreds, if not thousands, of special provisions that grant advantages to one group or another, ranging from child tax credits to incentives for sports organizations and charities to investment incentives for some industries. No other group, to my knowledge, has ever had the arrogance to ask that it be granted guarantees that its fiscal privileges will be assured for the future. And fourth, carbon dioxide taxes are only one of over 300 current policy and program measures that the federal and provincial governments have implemented to promote the reduction of GHG emissions. Together, they mark an unprecedented set of interventions for a small number of industries. I counted 24 different generic subsidies to renewable energy industries alone. If they were to be guaranteed the indefinite continuation of their carbon price advantages, would they expect the continuation of, and even guarantee of, all the other favors? This proposal makes no sense. And my comment is I found it very discerting, disconcerting that there are numerous odd, sly comments about bringing these plans in in a democracy throughout the program. And um, I'll tell you why else I find that disconcerting. Um, groups like the Deutsche Bank of Germany have uh, floated the idea of an eco-dictatorship to enforce climate neutrality. And they're not kidding. They're saying things like, well, you know, if there's a law that you have to retrofit your house, what if you don't want to? What if you don't have the money? What happens if your house cannot be retrofitted because of the nature of its construction? Well, they see the solution as having an eco-dictatorship, that a totalitarian government could just simply move in and uh, retrofit your house against your wishes, uh, maybe uh, take... Uh, a lien against your property, I don't know, to to force the payment for such retrofitting or simply demolish it if it doesn't actually meet the standard anymore. So the idea that somehow democracy is a problem for climate policy, it's a problem for climate tyranny, it's not a problem for climate and environmental policies. Those should be subject to open civil debate and full cost-benefit analysis before going forward and that is the process, the due process of democracy. But I did find it very disconcerting that at many times throughout this conference people made sort of odd quips about democracy and democracy you know getting in the way of doing uh, of saving the planet, shall we say. Well, and as I've shown here, you can see none of these policies will save the planet. It makes no difference what Canada does because the large emitters in the world are continuing apace and they don't really care. And it's very questionable that there's a climate crisis at all because that relies on the implausible scenarios of RCP 8.5 and 6. So without those, there's no climate emergency and there's no need to race to net zero. So Minister Gilbo mentioned that they're spending $109 billion. So that would be 109 of these, and this is just on climate policy. And this is made up of $100 bills in packs of 10000 So that's what a million dollars would look like, right? Here's what a billion dollars would look like. So 109 of these. And that money will be coming from you. But in fact, while we are so climate-addled here in the West, 
what is the global reality? The global reality is that the people in Europe and North America may not be aware that their combined populations are only 15% of the world's total. The population of Africa exceeds that combined total and the population of Asia is four times that large. So this is a Robert Lyman report, When Giants Arise, and he's showing that the emerging nations will far outstrip the West in terms of industrial development and emissions and they don't care. It's only we in the West who are committing economic suicide and as you can see our numbers are so tiny that we won't be saving the planet. So we have some additional resources that I really recommend to you. First is our Clean Electricity Standard Report. We did submit this to the government. I doubt that they've read it. We submitted it to the Clean Electricity Standard Review. Um, we have also submitted a Net Zero Report uh, to the Net Zero Advisory Board. Uh, Robert Lyman also did these two reports, which uh, are based on some research by J.P. Morgan and Michael Chimbalist, who is a very long-time energy analyst. And some of the speed bumps and the hazards on the road to decarbonization are based in the simple fact that um, many of the rare minerals required for uh, things like wind turbines, solar panels, uh, are, are things like copper, neodymium, um, and various uh, special minerals, critical minor minerals. And the prices of these are skyrocketing because of this race to net zero, where you have dozens of countries all suddenly going, yeah, let's build a, a thousand wind farms today. Um, so these are skyrocketing. Now, of course, uh, Minister Wilkinson and Minister Gilbo talked briefly also about things like uh, critical mineral advantage in Canada. So on the one hand they're saying okay we're gonna get off fossil fuels but look at this we can be a provider of critical minerals like neodymium to the world. Uh, you know we, we are a mineral rich country but first of all a mine takes about 16 years to open. Secondly it requires barrels and barrels of fossil fuels, of oil, of natural gas, tons of coal, because these are very big industrial uh, developments. You need to build infrastructure in and out, so you have to clear forests, you have to put roads into the mine, you have to pave that road, you have to bring in the heavy equipment, almost all of it runs on diesel. These are all very fossil fuel intense programs. So all the things that they talked about in the presentation about making reductions, again, they're completely upended when you say, okay, and now we're going to be a con uh, contributor of critical minerals to the world. Yeah, well, you're not going to be doing that with electric trucks. Sorry, it's just not going to happen. I mean, first of all, electric trucks have very limited carrying capacity, and there are very few of them in the world. Secondly, if you're going to do that kind of thing, you're going to have to charge all those trucks. So you need more power generation infrastructure, which will create more emissions. So, uh, you know, they just haven't thought through these things very well. And one of the other things in Speed Bumps Ahead, um, uh, Robert Lyman's summary of the J.P. Morgan uh, studies, they show that the cost of, uh, say, doing green industrial work like green steel, the costs are astronomical. So that would mean it, it, it is technically possible to do it, but then you're not competitive anymore. So if you have companies in China and India that are producing steel by conventional means using oil, gas, and coal to power the facility, uh, we might be, you know, virtue signaling here in Canada and patting ourselves on the back for being such great global citizens. Because now, look at that, Asselor Metal is now producing some green steel. We gave them $400 million as a pilot. Wow, let's see. Okay, let's have a pilot. Let's see. But practically speaking, that means that company will not be competitive on international markets. And uh, just as I showed you with the oil and gas competitors in the world, 
uh, you know, we'll lose our competitive advantage and we won't be saving the planet. So you have to ask, what's this really all about? Anyway, I recommend that people have a look at these reports. These two are quite short and to the point, so they're a very good read. They give you a quick overview. And of course, the links are within them. You can go through and read the more detailed reports if you want. And regarding climate change, uh, this is our rebuttal report to Environment Canada's report from 2019. And it's still quite valid, so I, I hope that you'd have a look at that and, um, and see really how you're being misled on climate. So I think the biggest recommendation, we have to save Canada, we have to quit the Paris Agreement, and we have to build pipelines. And we have to get serious about uh, our place as a world competitor. Um, Friends of Science, we're an independent group of Earth, atmospheric, and solar scientists, engineers, and citizens. We are celebrating our 20th year of offering climate science insights. And after a thorough review of a broad spectrum of literature on climate change, Friends of Science Society has concluded that the sun is the main driver of climate change, not carbon dioxide. So, um, I want to thank you very much for watching the presentation. Feel free to uh, ask us for more information. I'll put uh, the PowerPoint on the blog so that the links will be available for you. Uh, we are in our 20th year of operation. We're asking if people like our work or want to help us, even a $20 donation to help us continue our work and to celebrate our 20th year would be very helpful. We're a small nonprofit. We don't offer charitable receipts, tax receipts, and uh, we do provide our work free to the public and policymakers. I hope that you will take this information and do something constructive with it for Canada. Uh, I hope that you will stop the green gravy train that is presently being assembled in Ottawa because uh, your children will be carrying burdensome debt and maybe sitting in the dark, in the cold, and in a blackout because of some of these proposed policies. I know it sounds pretty grim, but you can just look at what's happening in Europe right now. These same kinds of policies have decimated the economies of Europe, and they will be putting millions of people into heat or eat poverty this winter and next winter, and possibly for the next decade. So on that unhappy note, um, I hope that uh, you will take some constructive action with this information. And please read our reports and share them, and uh, feel free to contact us. We like to hear from our viewers, and when we can, we'll provide you with information as you request it. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling. Thank you for watching.